Hey guys, welcome to the Summit Heights Fellowship broadcast. My name is Edward Crouch and I'm the lead pastor here at Summit Heights. And before we get to our broadcast, I just wanted to say thank you for joining us. If you have a few minutes today, check out our website, summitheightsfellowship.com and you'll learn all about our church. We have a great student ministry, an incredible children's ministry, preschool ministry, and we do small groups all over our community from Mineola to Quitman to Winsboro, Hawkins, even in Big Sandy. We would love to have you check us out one Sunday. If there's anything we could ever do for you, please take a few minutes, go to our website, fill out that prayer card on our website, and we would love to pray for you, reach out to you, or minister to you in any way we can. Again, thanks for joining us today. We hope you enjoy the broadcast. If there's any decisions or questions you have at the end of our broadcast, please reach out to us at our number on the screen or on our website. We would love to visit with you. Have a great day. Enjoy the broadcast. Well, amen. Good morning. How are you? Y'all liking this 10 o'clock time? <laughs> Until they, uh, they, they told me in staff meeting this last week, there were 22 two-year-olds uh, in one room last week. Uh, man, wow. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm out, you know. I, I, I don't know that I could do that. Um, so uh, get signed up and uh, get your background check and get signed up for that because it's fun. You never know how many is going to show up and with vacations and all that kind of stuff. So we're excited. Uh, thank you for being here. Second week of summer and uh, starting a new series today called WWJD, What Would Jesus Do? Have you ever wondered? You ever just thought? It's the old bracelets we used to wear and, and uh, the shirts. And this is way back when this deal came out. And, and so what we thought we'd do this summer is we would begin to ask that question, looking at some cultural issues, hot topics, um, kind of answering some questions maybe you've never heard addressed in church. If you grew up like I did in a very conservative background, we're going to address and talk about some things that, um, honestly, I've, I've never heard taught from the pulpit. Some of you, you grew up in a more liberal uh, background and, and it was just assumed and, and you were able to deal with it and you didn't really think much about it. But here's what I know. We live in such a plur pluralistic and multicultural society that to have any prejudice whatsoever is frowned upon. And yet here's the truth. Everybody in this room has prejudices. Everybody in this room, including myself, has judgments. And the more I read the scripture, the older I get, and the more honest I am, the more I'm convinced of my dislike of some people and things, and then of my arrogant self-righteousness on some days more than others. And get this, we were sitting in an elders meeting a few weeks back, and, and Jake Connor said something, uh, one of our elders, he said, we even have a limit to our grace. And let me explain that because, see, I want all the grace in the world towards me, right? When I mess up, when I'm self-righteous on that day, or, or maybe I'm doing something I shouldn't be doing, I want all the grace in the world. But when it comes to certain sins, I have less grace because it's not the sin I struggle with. Or maybe it's the sin I got victory over, and now somebody else has that, and, and I will just go so far, and then I'm done, right? I know this hurts, doesn't it? And I know it sounds terrible, and it, and it is, but I think if you were honest, you would admit too, you have people and things that you don't like, and you pass judgment on them. And pretty much our list is all the same, isn't it? I mean, if you really want to get honest, if we all put our list together, you may have a little bit different things on your list than I would have on mine, but at the end of the day, really what we're trying to do is who gets to wear the white hats and the black hats, right? Who gets to be the good guys and the bad guys? And it seems like somewhere along the journey, we've boiled that down. And, and this, it helps explain the finger pointing in church and, and now in our culture at large, especially in the political world. And just relax, we're not going political this summer, okay? All right, I, I, don't, I, don't, even have the, I don't even have the energy for that. <laughs> so if you do, then bless you. But it, it kind of explains this tension between blacks and whites, young and old, rich and poor, the ugly and the beautiful, the smart and the dumb the urban and the rural, the self-help versus self-acceptance, self the, the victims and perpetrators, Republicans and Democrats, Chevy and Ford, Mike and PC, right? <laughs> Married and single, homosexual or heterosexual, male and female, educated and uneducated, just to name a few. 
But see, here's the bottom line. And, and I want you to hear this tonight, today, not tonight. The bottom line is that we all in this room are self-righteous to some extent. There's not one of us. We're all prone to secretly believe that we are somehow better than someone in this room. And we're all prone to believe that we're better than them out there, whoever them out there is, right? And the scriptures teach us that no one is inherently righteous and that our only righteousness comes from Jesus. You see, we as Christ followers, those of us who claim to be Jesus imitators, know that there is nothing righteous in us. In fact, look at Romans 3, 10 and 12 on the screen. Here's what the scripture says. There is no one. Everybody say no one. No. There's no one righteous, not even one. So you may be sitting there going, oh, no, I am. No, this is Paul says not even one. There's not one of us that are righteous. There is no one who understands. There is no one who seeks God. All, everybody say all. All have turned away and they together became worthless. There is no one who does good, not even one. And you see, if we fail to embrace this and we fail to understand this truth and choose to pursue righteousness on our own, we commit that grievous sin of self-righteousness. And unrepentant self-righteousness in the church permits us to justify our sin by declaring ourselves clean or healed and others unclean are not yet healed. And we immediately pass judgment on them. I mean, really when you think about sin, it falls into two different areas, universal and particular. There are those sins that we call universal sins and, and you can look this up in 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 10. I'm not gonna throw it up on the screen because I'm, we're, we're heading somewhere quickly this morning. But there's those universal sins that, that, that the Bible condemns for all people of all cultures. For instance, immorality, idolatry, adultery, prostitution, homosexuality, theft, drunkenness, greed, slander, swindling, pretty much all the themes of a Netflix show, amen? Okay, Amazon, well, ABC, okay, I'm meddling. So those are those universal sins that the scripture says we should all avoid, right? But then there's those particular sins. Those are those offenses that, that, that are sinful for some people under some circumstances, but not for all people under all circumstances. And, and all Christians are commanded by God to avoid universal sins. But listen to me, Christians are also commanded by God to avoid sins that are particular to them without unfairly condemning or restricting other people because you don't have that freedom. You may disdain cigarettes, but it's hard for us to forbid someone enjoying a cigarette or a cigar because the scripture never addresses smoking. I'm gonna let that sit for a minute. Now, if you're smoking nine packs a day, let's talk, amen? Obviously, it's not healthy, but the scripture doesn't speak directly to that. Some of you in this room hate alcohol, anything to do with it. But the reality is, you cannot forbid everyone in the church over the age of 21 from drinking alcohol because the Bible doesn't. This is important, I think, what Paul means throughout the New Testament when he speaks of the weak and the strong Christians. And listen, in truth, every Christian in this room is both weak and strong. Everyone in this room. So in some areas, we need to restrict our freedoms because of our weaknesses, amen? While we're able to use our Christian liberty in areas where we're strong, and we may have different personal convictions in the matters of culture, but we should welcome those different views as we look at that. Because uniformity undermines the mission of the church. God calls us to be in unity, not uniformity. You see, there's some in the Christian world that just restricts everything. And maybe you grew up like that. Maybe you grew up in the world that basically you couldn't listen to certain musical styles I, I, there was even a season in, when I was growing up, we couldn't listen to certain beats of music <laughs> because certain beats of music were demonic. <laughs> Getting tattoos, watching movies, playing cards, sinners, <laughs> body piercing, all these things. And all of a sudden, there's this whole group and sect of Christianity that just basically you can't do anything. And then there's that other side of that coin. And those are those permissive Christians. 
And they're prone to name everything a particular sin. Well, it's not a sin for me. It's not a sin for you. And it's okay. And hey, let's just all get along. And, and no sin is ever called out. You see, for many of us, we're no different than the players in the New Testament. Because in the New Testament, in Jesus' day, there are four players. I want to put them up on the screen because they were the Pharisees. They were the Sadducees. They were the Zealots. And the Essenes, let me, let me explain how these guys work. There are the Pharisees and these guys would separate themselves from culture. They had nothing to do with the culture. In fact, they were so zealous and conservative that, that Paul was believed to be a, a, a Pharisee. Some even believe that Jesus would have fallen into the Pharisee group in his day. But these guys were so highly committed to getting back to the scriptures, doesn't sound bad, does it? That they, that they literally had their brand of old time religion, right? They, they took the law of God, the 10 commandments, and they added 613 laws to that to make sure that they were completely separate from from the culture. They wanted to maintain their purity because so they would isolate themselves in culture and would have nothing to do with anybody out there. And then they believed they were good and clean before God. So they'd look down at their, no, down their noses at other people that weren't as good as they are and pass judgment on them. <laughs> and before we're too hard on these guys, because they would overlook their own sins and hypocrisy, never looking at their own stuff, we travel this same road when we impose man-made rules on people in the name of achieving holiness, when God's word doesn't restrict it, or we hide out in Christian culture, we travel this road of self-righteousness and this judgmental attitude that sees the sin of others, but not our own sin, when we're always judging somebody else and not looking at our own journey. And sadly, so many walked out in the church because of judgmental people and some of you have come back to Summit Heights and come back and walk in with the Lord. The reason you left is because of groups like this that pass judgment and you can see through that. So there was those guys in Jesus' day that separated from the culture, those Pharisees, but then there were those guys that blended into the culture like the Sadducees. While the Sadducees were, were more culturally accommodating a little more liberal than the Pharisees. While the Pharisees pulled away of holiness, the Sadducees, rather, they just jumped in feet first. Didn't believe in a resurrection, didn't believe in an afterlife, didn't believe in all that. Their compromise was completely thorough. In fact, we run this road today when we so engage in culture and we so get into culture that we literally don't take sin and scripture seriously anymore. These guys were so blended in when we become more apt to be approved by the culture than, than, to be, than, than to be faithful to God, that we want the culture to love us so much that we blend in and don't worry about being faithful to God, we, we run this road and eventually it leads to this whole universalism standpoint that all, all roads lead to God and they don't. It's only through Jesus. And then the third one, Ruling like a zealot, these guys, these guys are fun. And by the way, let me stop and say, since we covered two and we're going to cover the next two, I find myself in every one of these camps, depending on what day it is, right? Depending on what I'm watching on Fox News, I, I know, or listening to 97.5 talk radio, and I find myself in every one of these camps. Because there's some days my self-righteousness as a Pharisee rises up. There's some days where I become the Sadducee and I just want to blend in. And then there's days I want to be a zealot, that I want to pursue political power. And I want to overthrow the government in the name of Jesus. Can I get an amen? amen. And I want to yell at the TV and I, want to, and I want to drive up there and I want to be a part of it. Those guys were in Jesus' day. These guys, they were, they were going to take Christianity to the masses, but they were going to do it by force. Some of us today, we do that. In the right and the left and the conservative and the liberals, we all have these labels on ourselves. And many of us are more interested in politics than in sermons about sin. Many of us are more interested in signing the petition than actually signing up to learn what the Bible says. And the church today has just kind of flipped on its head. And then this last group that was part of Jesus, there was the separating from culture of the Pharisees, the blending of the culture of the Sadducees, the ruling over the culture of the Zealots. And then this last one was the Essenes. They just ignored culture altogether. They, these guys were not concerned with being separated. They, they weren't even concerned about relevancy. They weren't even concerned about politics. All they wanted to do 
is to personally encounter God and spiritual experiences. Sounds good, doesn't it? The problem is they completely withdrew out of the culture. And they, they almost in monkish style living, just disconnected completely, all in an effort to be close to God, withdrawing from society. They denied themselves pleasures and they lived free from distraction because all they wanted to do was focus on God. And while we have those extreme groups in our world today, there's also just this group of Christians that they just wanna be so close to God, they'll never commit to any church. They're always running to this high and to this high and to this movement and to this movement and they never just hunker down and go, God, what do you have for me? It's almost like a spiritual junkie. They're looking for the next spiritual high instead of getting serious about the culture at hand. You see, the problem with each of these groups is they have their ways of seeing godliness as they defined it, not as God defined it. And when we get into this stuck in this and this desire to be holy and culturally relevant and resolve, transforming social agendas, spiritual experiences, they can't be brought about by legalism. They can't be brought about by liberalism, legislation, or lunacy. Because while these four groups seem different, they're in many ways alike. See, if we don't find ourselves in this because the Pharisees and the Essenes didn't go far enough into culture. And the, and the Sadducees and the Zealots went way too far into culture. And the popularity of going too far and not far enough really shouldn't surprise us. Because a few months ago, as we were working through the book of John, we closed in John chapter 17. Jesus saw this coming. He even saw where we wouldn't be that much different in our day today. As he prayed for his disciples, look what he says in John 17, 13 through 18. He said, I'm coming to you now. He's praying. But I say these things while I'm still in the world so that they may have the full measure of my joy within them. I have given them your word and, and, and the world has hated them for they are not of the world any more than I am of the world. And my prayer is not that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. So sanctify them by the truth. Your word is the truth. As you sent me into the world, now I have sent them into the world. Jesus knew with his death was coming, that Jesus had nearly completed this task of the Father's assignment. And Jesus began to pray before his death and resurrection that that would birth joy in us, that when he died and three days later rose again, that there would be something in us that bubbled out of us in joy. And the point is important because too often we think of Reaching people out there is something that we got to build a task to go do. And the reality is, is the way we reach people in our world is by the joy that overflows in our life, by being in relationship with Jesus Christ. You see, there's two sides of this equation. Because Jesus prayed that we would live on mission. And what Jake was talking about a while ago, a life of tension, that we're holding the gospel in one hand, and we're holding the culture in the other that we wouldn't be too far pulled into the culture and we wouldn't be so heavenly minded that we're no earthly good. You see, for many of us, we just avoid everything. We don't wanna be near those people. And we get this way, the longer we're in church, there's a natural pull to just avoid everybody when there's that tension there between the culture and the gospel. And all of a sudden, it becomes knowledge without application. See, here, here's what I've learned about, and this happens in churches all the time, is that when churches begin avoiding them out there and all of culture, it's the, the end is near. And churches don't even realize that the end is near because they wake up one day and they have all this knowledge, but no application. They have all this theology, but no application because they're avoiding everything. And I watch churches do it all the time where they'll call us and go, man, how do we grow? One day we used to be here and now we only have this and how do we regain that? Well, you, at some point you gotta engage the culture. You can't just avoid it forever. But then there's the other side of that equation is those guys just immerse themselves in everything and they no longer speak of sin. They no longer speak of repentance in a personal way. Now they'll, they'll talk about the culture at large, but it's never personal. And they just simply baptize every belief in the name of relevance. And nothing separates the church. And so we have these extremes in the church. And when we immerse ourselves in that side of that equation, all of a sudden it just becomes God loves everybody and he does. And God's gonna save everybody and he will through Jesus. 
But basically, God's just going to take everybody to heaven because he didn't have the courage to judge them. Follow me? See, the problem with both sides is if you think, well, I can't be around sinners and I can't be around evil. I can't go to Red Rooster because they serve beer. I, I can't buy from Brookshire's now because they have wine. And you think I'm kidding because I grew up in that, right? And so all of a sudden now we're just avoiding everybody because we think the gospel is not strong enough to keep us pure. And if you're living in that side where everything's permissive and you can do anything you want to because everything is blessed and God's just gonna love you and take everybody to heaven, then again, you're, you're, you're stripping the gospel of the power to change lives. Jesus Christ died to set us apart. You see, people who avoid the culture love God but fail to love their neighbor. And people who are immersed in the culture love their neighbor but fail to love God. And Jesus expects us to both love our neighbor and love God. In other words, we've got to be in the culture, but at some point, we love them enough to let them know their sin separates them from God. And Jesus is the answer. So here's what I want to do over the summer, since we've kind of thrown us all into a group now. I want us to do this kind of game of, um, I want to pick the speck out of your eye. Well, I know very well there's a plank hanging out of mine. And so very intentionally, we're going to take some subjects this summer. So you, you don't want to really miss, I'm, just, I'm going to tell you. Because we're going to play how all of us come in with judgments. And so many times the judgments we have are not biblical. They're not backed up from Scripture. And so today, I, I want to take the first one and play that plank and speck with the Christians me growing up considered alcohol consumption a sin and God's people should never touch it and it should be a measure of either our lack of or depth of holiness. So here's my question. What would Jesus do? Would Jesus drink alcohol? Let me give you some facts. This is interesting because if you study church history, you'll find out in church history that throughout the years, that the church has greatly enjoyed alcohol. In fact, St. Gaul was a missionary to the Celtic nation and he was a renowned brewer. He made his own beer. After Charlemagne's reign, the Church of England and Europe became the exclusive brewer of all of Europe. In fact, when a young woman was preparing for marriage in Europe, the church brewed a special bridal ale. It's where we get derive our word bridal. This is interesting, John Calvin. His annual salary package included upwards of 250 gallons of wine to be enjoyed by him and his guest. Are any elders in the room? <laughs> y'all are so uncomfortable right now. I wish y'all could see y'all's face. <laughs> You're like, holy cow, is he really going down this road? Hang tight. Y'all remember the great theologian Martin Luther, the Reformation? His wife, Catherine, was a skilled brewer. In fact, uh, in his love letters to her, when they were apart, he lamented his inability to drink her beer. <laughs> and, and for you guys that think you're pure, when the Puritans landed on Plymouth Rock, do you know what the first permanent building was built here? It was a brewery. And tragically, in America, around the turn of the 20th century, prohibition came to dominate not only our land, but it came into the church. And denominations began to condemn alcohol as sinful. In fact, in 1869, there was this great Methodist pastor named Dr. Thomas Welch, who created a grape juice so that the church would no longer have to use wine in communion. Yeah, interesting, huh? And see, as I say this, and I look at some of your faces, I know some of you right now have all kinds of questions. In fact, if you're visiting with us this morning, you may be thinking, what in the world have I stepped into? Because I also know that if you don't search the scriptures, you may walk away with a man-made rule like the Pharisees. And if you don't search the scriptures, you may become a zealot who takes particular sins and makes them universal to everyone. And so see, we find ourselves in all these different camps, but I also want to say this. I know some of you in this room, just the mere mention of alcohol is, is very personal to you because you grew up with an abusive father or you grew up with an abusive mother or you had an abusive family member down the road or spouse. And so for you, alcohol is very personal. So, so I want to briefly address 
some common arguments that some of you may already have about and against alcohol consumption. So let me mention some points. Let me throw up four things up on the screen right here. Look at this about alcohol consumption. Number one, there are biblical pro prohibitions against drunkenness. Everybody say drunk. Everybody say drunk. It's different than having a drink. Okay. So the scripture condemns drunkenness as a sin, right? Is there anything wrong with having a drink? No. Drunkenness is a sin. Also, no priest was to drink alcohol while performing his duties. I think that's pretty wise. Amen? No telling what I'd say up here. No king was to drink while judging law. Very, very wise. An elder or a pastor cannot be a drunkard. And we know that the drunkard will not inherit the kingdom of God. I, totally different than drinking. In fact, here's some biblical problems caused by drunkenness. Look at this. Incest, poverty, murder, madness, violence, late night and early morning drinking. Got to push through. Gluttony, poverty, loudness combined with laughter and then prolonged sleep. Adultery, hallucinations, vomiting, nakedness, mockery, brawling, legendary antics, home of beer, staggering, slothfulness, escapism, depression, staying up all night. You see, I think we all can agree that drunkenness is a sin that can cause a life of misery. You see, I know there's probably another concern sitting in here if you're teenagers in the room this morning. Oh my gosh, if we say it's not wrong, they're going to all go get drunk. See, that's a whole nother camp that we just choose not to be biblically faithful out of fear that it might give someone permission. See, we all agree, Romans 13 says, underage drinking, that we must obey the laws of the land. And so if you're under the age of 21, no, you should not be drinking. It's against the law because we want to honor God. Even in our effort that we don't want to tell teenagers that, oh my gosh, drinking's not a sin, or oh my gosh, this is not a sin, oh my gosh, this is not a sin, where there's liberty in that, we'll even raise up all these other ideas. Like, for instance, in an effort to prohibit God's people from alcohol consumption, some Christians argue that there was a new wine and mixed wine in the Bible, and it was a non-alcoholic wine. The problem is it's not biblically faithful, because according to Scripture, new wine can still intoxicate. And mixed wine talks about wine that is mixed with spices and, and, and different wines and various wines and, and never talks about wine cut with water. Only one time is the scripture talk about wine cut with water and that's when merchants are trying to rip off other people and cutting the wine. When God refers to pouring out his mixed wine on his enemies, he's not talking about he's going to dilute justice. No, he's talking about he's fixing to wipe them out. <laughs> And finally, the Bible does speak of grape juice. So if God didn't want us to drink alcohol, he could have very well, Jesus could have very well used the word grape juice. So I want to give you three positions on alcohol. In his book, God Gave Wine, Kenneth Gentry describes three positions. And what makes this guy interesting is he didn't drink. He doesn't drink. So he took just an honest look at scripture and the views of alcohol and scripture and the first one is the prohibitionist. They teach that drinking is a sin and that alcohol itself is evil. In fact, that's the way I grew up, that drinking was not only a sin, but alcohol was evil. And this position can't be defended because the Bible teaches that God makes wine that gladdens the heart of man. In fact, Jesus' very first miracle, he created over 100 gallons of wine. That's a few gallons there, isn't it? right? And think about this. Jesus ate enough food and drank enough alcohol to be falsely accused of being a drunkard and a glutton. See, that makes some of you just, I, I just wish you could, I, I, Joe, I wish I could take a camera and put it out here. <laughs> so if alcohol is inherently evil, then God is evil because he makes it. And Jesus is simple because he drank it. Isn't that amazing? And to risk pointing out the obvious, it'd be a terrible thing for us to try to be holier than Jesus. So there's prohibitionist, 
And then there's the abstinence stance. And that wrongly teaches that drinking is not sinful, but that Christians should avoid drinking out of love for others because we never want to cause somebody to stumble. You heard that before? And yeah, I think we should avoid drinking in the presence of people who are unable to practice moderation. I think we would never want to practice our freedoms at the expense of others. We would never want to practice our freedoms with someone who you know is struggling to come out of that addiction. So we must be wise, but it's unreasonable to demand that all Christians abstain from alcohol. It's, it's unreasonable because the Bible teaches that God gave wine to his people even though they used it to worship a pagan god Baal. So God gives them wine and they worship Baal. So now let's just throw it all out. The problem is, is that Jesus drank alcohol even though there were undoubtedly people in his day who were alcoholics. Think about how many times the scripture is talking about drunkenness. This isn't something new in our culture. This is something that's been going on forever. And Paul says that only a demon would compel Bible teachers to forbid things that God makes good. Drinking alcohol can be done in a way that glorifies God. You see, here's the third point, and this is moderation. And I believe moderation rightly teaches that drinking's not a sin and that each of us, as a believer in Jesus Christ, should let our conscience guide us without judging others. So some of you are gonna leave today. You're not getting out in 22 minutes early like you did last week. <laughs> some of you are gonna leave today and you're gonna go to Red Rooster. And, and maybe in the past you've judged other people who went ahead and got a drink at 11.30 in the morning. You see, I, I, think, I think we've got to rightly teach that drinking is not a sin. But we must let our conscience and the Holy Spirit guide us without judging others. It's reasonable, it's biblical, because wine itself is neutral and can be used both in good and bad ways. It can be for good and for bad. When used in the right and redeemed way, it's a gift from God to be drunk with gladness, particularly when feasting in Psalms 104 and Ecclesiastes 9 and 10. When used in this way, it's a foretaste of the kingdom of God that's coming, that we're celebrating, that the new kingdom will include new wine. You see, when used in this way, feasting and drinking, we can actually worship God. In fact, there's biblical occasions to drink alcohol in moderation. Look at this. Celebration in Genesis, the Lord's Supper. Some people ask us, will we ever go to wine in the Lord's Supper? I don't know, maybe. Will we, medicinal purposes, where Paul told Timothy, son, drink a little bit of wine for your stomach. Not the whole bottle. Worship, thanksgiving to God, happiness. You may be sitting here this morning, why does this matter? Why, why would you dive into something like this? It matters because I think alcoholism and alcohol and drunkenness and enjoying a glass of wine or maybe enjoying a good dark beer because light beer's a sin, amen? <laughs> it matters because we all have these things. Maybe alcohol is not your thing hang out, come back next week, well, we may address your thing and stick around to July and we'll find your limit of grace, amen? <laughs> and here's why it matters, because all of us have this camp in us that we are quick to judge and we are quick to call ourselves righteous when there's not one of us righteous outside of Jesus Christ. It is Jesus that makes us righteous. And, I, and listen, what we taught back in the, the winter that for a disciple to be mature means we gotta be an imitator of Jesus. So Jesus is our example. Jesus is our example in that. You see, here's what I want you to remember. Our mission is not about abstinence, it's about redemption. And we need to be known more for what we are for than what we are against. And here's what we're for. We're for the gospel, the freedom of Jesus Christ to set men and women free, amen? That's redemptive. That's redemptive. Our goal is not to avoid drinking or singing or working or not even to avoid playing or eating or lovemaking. No, it, it's, instead our goal must be to redeem those things that God gave us. To redeem those things so that, so that when Jesus Christ is in us and we're following him, that the joy overflows and it's not a task out there. 
It's not that, hey, now we got to go win the loss. Listen, no. When you're engaging the gospel and the culture, then there's something that's spilling over in you called the joy of Jesus because the gospel has set you free. And there's something in us that we've turned every task into a zealot, a Pharisee, a Sadducee, and even an Essene. And when Jesus just says, look, here's the tension. You're in the world, so God protect them. But I'm leaving them here, and I've taught them, so I'm turning them loose. And so it becomes this tension that the church, we hold to the gospel, that Jesus changes lives and takes the unrighteous and makes them righteous. So that then it bubbles over in that joy and it spills out so that we engage the culture out there and doesn't judge. Because we're quick to be a Pharisee. I'm quick to be a Sadducee. I'm even way too fast to be a zealot. And there's some days I just want to retreat. And yet God says the gospel and the culture is to be held in tension because he left us here so that people would know Jesus. So here's what I would say to you. If you can enjoy a good drink, enjoy it. Don't be drunk. Okay? It's a sin. It'll ruin your life. So if you can practice that freedom, do so in worship and celebration. If you can't, then worship God as you restrict that freedom because we still hold on to that tension. And then for both of us to not pass judgment on each other or even the world out there. Amen? So I'm going to love you. I got to be honest with you, I've been doing this 30 years this month. Okay? But, li- but listen, to me, listen, I've never preached this. I- I'm, I'm seeing my friends back in the back over there. We all grew up just right down the road from each other in two very similar churches. And, and I also realize there's going to be people watching us on Facebook today that's going to disagree with what I just spoke. And, and, and there's going to be people on e-text that watch this. So, so here, here's what I would say if you disagree, and maybe you're here this morning and you're struggling with this. Get in the Word. Okay, get in the Word. Don't go home and Google, okay? Last I checked, Google is not an inerrant Word of God, amen? I, I could be wrong on that, I don't know, all right? Go home and get in the Word and, and drill down on this. And, and if you can't drink, don't. If you can, enjoy it. And if you can't do either, don't judge, Love God. Amen? Church, I love you. Thank you for letting me be your pastor. Thank you for letting me go back home. I I got to preach last week at a church I hadn't been to in 26 years. And I was a youth pastor there. They started. It was that church where one of our elders who just moved away, Jason Henderson, got saved when I was his youth pastor. And uh, so a lot of depth going back to that place. And um, thank you for letting me be out and love on a group of people over there. Uh, Well, I know you were loved on by my um, college professor, um, Dr. Utley, okay? So let's pray, and then we're going to take communion, and we're going to worship this morning. And and, uh, no no formal invitation this morning. I'm going to let you sit on this this week, and uh, then don't miss next week, okay? Let's pray together. Y'all come on, band. Father, I love you. Thank you for today. Thank you for my family. As Danielle was saying, this is is our family. This is um, home. And God, I know that there's some here this morning, they, they struggle. God, there's some that struggle this morning because they overdid it this week. And the problem is it wasn't just this week, it's been a life. And so Father, I pray if there's someone here struggling this morning with addiction, that God, you would, you would begin that process of setting them free. That they would get into our recovery program called CR, Celebrate Recovery. And they would find that place of freedom changing everything but their name and learning their identity in Jesus. And God, for those of us in this room that, God, we struggle with it because every once in a while we overdo it, then God, help us hold tight to the gospel that you can change us. And God, for those in this room that just enjoys it and celebrates, and God bless them. 
Father, would you help us see our culture, the world, the way you see it, and protect us, protect us, Father, from the extremes. So, Lord, I love you. We're going to take communion, Father, because you said as often as we eat or drink, do this in remembrance of you. We thank you for the body and the blood of Jesus, that we are saved by his sacrifice. We are saved by that resurrection, that he now lives and is seated at your right hand. And, God, we long for the day, even more in this culture, of your soon return, that we'll get to be with you and worship you forever and eternity. But until then, until then, Father, Help us hold tightly to that tension of the gospel and the culture that the people that are far from you would see the hope that we have in Jesus and want some of that. So, Lord, I love you. Thank you for Jesus, and we ask it in his name. And everybody said? Hey, guys, welcome back. We hope you enjoyed the broadcast today. And if there's any decision you felt like God is leading you to make today, we would encourage you to... Uh, make that decision and to go online. There's a prayer tab on our website that you can go to. We'd love to pray for you. We would also love for you, if you accepted Christ today, to send us a text. We have a number at the bottom of the screen that you can text us the word accept if you accepted Christ. Or if you would like to know more about baptism, just shoot us a text with the word baptize to that number on the screen and we'll get to you, I promise you. Hey, have a great day and listen, if you're looking for a great church and you don't have a church home, come visit us one Sunday. We have two services, one nine, one at 11. We'd love to see you, have a great week.